I'm here speaking not simply as a researcher, although I am a professionally trained researcher, um, but the one that doesn't subscribe to you know, this old paradigm of detached and dispassionate pursuit of knowledge. I am passionate as a person, and my training, my training as a professional researcher enables me to temper my passion and uh, try to sift through what I consider facts from my biases. And having said that, I also want to make um, one more personal comment before I go into the heart of uh, my presentation. The question of Rohingya is the central, most existential challenge to me, both as a Burmese and as a Buddhist, because on the question of persecution of Rohingya, we as the Burmese people who claim to subscribe to Buddhist philosophy of loving kindness are violating the very principle on which our collective identity as Buddhist Burmese people. There are Christian Burmese, there are Muslim Burmese, you know, th that's uh, very obvious. And thir uh, thirdly, I came from an extended military clan, and some of my relatives were senior commanders who included um, Than Shui's first commanding officer who married the dictator and his wife when he was a young captain. And my, the Burmese equivalent of godfather was the police commissioner in 1991 who implemented these genocidal policies in from his headquarters in Situ. He was the man who put me on the airplane to the California when I was a young student in 1988, before the uprising, when I left the country. And so this is not just simply a research work that I pursue professionally. This is an existential ch challenge. So therefore, I, th you know, I throw my lot in with the Rohingya, whom I consider Myanmar, Thayenda, and my own kind. This will be an affront to the Burmese society that has become a product of what Joseph Goebbels called, you repeat a simple lie a thousand times, thousands of times, it becomes truth. And we have a situation where 90% of the Burmese population in the country who have never ever set their foot in Rakhine State because of geographic barrier we call Arakan Range. And we have never, many of us, most of us, have met a f flesh and blood Rohingya in our entire life. I lived in Burma for 24 years and I'm 50 now. I had never heard anyone utter the word Rohingya. And I, I came from a fairly educated uh, middle class family. And even someone like myself, with the level of privileges and education I had, did not know that Rohingya exist. But the fact is, the fact that I do not know, or I did not know that Rohingya exist, does not mean they do not exist. And there are you know, ex-diplomats from this country, UK, that have argued that the Rohingya was not in the India office archives. Not simply because the Rohingya did not make it to, into the white man's archives, doesn't mean they do not exist. So now, on to my presentation. This is based on a three-year study I conducted with um, my uh, colleague. Um, and this is coming out as a 30,000 word journal article from the University of Washington Law School called Pacific Rim Law and Policy Journal. First, we need to understand who the Rohingyas are. The Rohingyas are the people who are pre-nation states, just like many of us, just like the Kachins, just like the Chin, just like Karen, Wa. They are borderland people. You know, the, uh, what uh, James Scott called borderland people. They are pre-nations. They belong to different political systems. Yeah? And they speak um, a similar dialect with, uh, like the Chittagonian uh, Bengali. But that doesn't mean that they are Bengali, or they are Chittagonians, or they belong to 
Bangladesh because they speak a similar dialect as Chittagongian across the border. Because the Burmese, who speak a modern version of Arakanese or Rakhine language, no Rakhine would ever consider themselves Burmese. And they will be offended if you say, you speak a dialect of Burmese, therefore you are Burmese. And yet, we do not apply this logic to the Rohingya. And of the um, so-called 135 official um, races, and then some of the races are simply names of villages and rivers. And villages and rivers are deemed races. And two million Rohingyas are not accepted as a self-recognized and once officially recognized Tayinda or nationality of our country or fully fledged citizens. That is the situation. So, we have a scenario where the majority of Burmese believe in a single state manufactured lie since the 1970s that the Rohingyas are nothing, viruses that have invaded into the geographic body of our country. And therefore, we must eliminate them, repel them, and confine them to some area. So the, so the Rohingya issue as the Burmese, in a characteristically racist manner, describe as Bengali. Bengalis are viruses. When you have viruses, what do you do? You eliminate them, you attack them. That is a, the first symbolic step towards destruction of Rohingya. And then everything flows from it. And also, there have been peop, um, reports and analyses that have described or characterized the Rohingya situation, or Bengali situation, as they call it, as primarily communal. Despite historical and ethnic complexities, we have a situation that is empirically and verifiably black and white. Yeah? And, uh, and also, there's another argument on this, especially coming from the International Crisis Group and others, who said the persecution, not persecution, the communal violence, in quotes, between Buddhist Rakhines and Muslim Rohingyas are a sad but almost inevitable dimension of any multi-ethnic society transitioning from authoritarian political systems to a more open system that is completely factually false because the persecution of Rohingyas began 35 years before the country opened up. The, you know, the argument just does not hold. So how do I know what I think I know and what I'm going to share with you? I've done, actually my co uh, you know, colleague, uh, co-researcher and myself, we've done extensive archival research in both Burmese and English languages, just about Everything written on Rohingya, we have read, we have sifted through it. We have looked at uh, the documents that um, uh, you know, my colleague Matt here um, um, <laughs> analyzed and uh, uh, you know, wrote um, a, a very credible report about. We read that document six months ago. We, it, it went into our views um, and guided conversations uh, with people including you know, eight Burmese military officers stationed in Rakhine State. You know, the highest level of like a, a military officers that uh, I have interviewed personally, brigadier generals. And uh, um, then I've been also personally interviewed three members, three very prominent members of the Rakhine Inquiry Commission um, uh, set up by President Thein Sein. We've also interviewed UN INGO staff, and last but not least, Rohingya themselves, who are victims, uh, who were witnesses, and we have done these interviews in Burma, Bangladesh, Malaysia. I cannot go there. My colleague could, and so you know, like uh, he did that. Uh, Malaysia, Thailand, UK, USA, over a period of three years, and um, out of our three years' research, we have concluded what we have is not a situation 
where Myanmar as a country is marching potentially in, into the future of genocide. We are seeing what we call the slow burning genocide that is unfolding with characteristic spikes of killings with pl and then followed by plateaus of you know, carefully designed and structured uh, destruction of Rohingya as an ethnic, religious, and national group. And the Burmese government, or Myanmar government, successive Myanmar governments, we have found, based on our evidence, are guilty of four acts of genocide out of five acts spelled out by the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide uh, in 1948 and then in the Rome Statute, Article 6. So um, here, I juxtapose genocidal acts with types of atrocities that Rohingyas have been subject to since 1978. This is not a transitional issue. This is not a communally led violence. This is state sponsor with communal collaboration within the Rakhine people, and not all of whom are racist, but many extremist elements. Genocidal acts are acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. Number one, uh, a killing members of the group. There are plenty of you know, uh, evidence of killing members of the group. The number of people killed, maybe 20 or 200,000 or 20,000, it doesn't matter. They are killed on the basis of their ethnicity. That is considered a genocidal act. Yeah? Um, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Destruction of group identity is a symbolic violence. If, if you walk down the street and you, know, you are told repeatedly you are not a human being, you are a dog, yeah? that is a violence. You have to de defend your human existence. And Rohingyas have been subject to this violent process over the past 36 years. If you walk down to Sitwe, and I've been, we've interviewed people who will say, police officer will come up to them and um, ask them, what are you, Rohingya? The minute you mentioned that you are a Rohingya, you get punches. Yeah? Symbolic violence accompanied by literal and physical violence because you claim that you are Rohingya. Your group identity is destroyed. And then the, the um, uh, sexual violence, forced labor, there's a, there's a pattern of different forms of violence and rights abuses. And uh, here, what's interesting, you know, uh, uh, following up on what um, Matthew Smith was saying, the conditions of life calculated to bring about the destruction of Rohingya as a group. We, that has not been explored. And Lumpkin, Raphael Lumpkin, the guy who, the man who gave us the word genocide and was a force behind genocide convention, he called it underfeeding, underfeeding, under, you know, like destruction of a community does not always necessarily require machine guns, he said. You know, underfeeding, he calculated the calorie intake of the Germans, the, the Hungarians, the Poles, and then the Jews. The Germans got 70 to 80% nutrient intake, the Poles get 20, sorry, like the Jews get 20 to 10 or 15%. Um, then two child policy here, imposing measures intended to prevent Birds within the group, that is so within the territory of a genocide. And, and, and the last one, forcibly transferring uh, children of the group to another group, um, you know, I, I think I won't argue. So here, this is the last slide. The intent may not be extracted from national policy documents because we have a military government that rules the country by law. We do not have the rule of law. We have the rule by law by the generals. And the devastating impact on the lives, or the conditions of the group is here. Doctor-patient ratios among the Rohingyas is in one area, in Mount I think it's one is to 73,000. 
In another area, I think Budi down is one is to 86,000 Rohingya. These are like a UN figures. And the national average is one is to 700. And, and it is actually worse than Syria's situation. 40 doctors for two millions in a civil war Syria today. The Rohingyas have fared worse than Syrians in the current civil war climate. And then Rohingya death rates among under five, three times national average. And extreme malnutrition, it is designed, yeah? It is designed. If you forcibly relocate an entire population or part of the population to encampment areas and then deny them opportunities to make their, to, to make their own food or to receive provisions of emergency food, medicine, water, then your intent is so clear. You can infer that from the very acts and the, uh, the consequences uh, that have on, this, uh, on that uh, community. And then severe restriction for Rohingya. Rohingyas, in, not in camps, they have been living in 11 security grips, grids that are armed and they, they cannot move from one neighborhood to another. So I think this is an inconvenient genocide. Genocide that cannot be known by its name because it doesn't serve the interest of the Americans or the British or the Australians or anybody. So in 2009, Human Rights Watch came up with a report and prophetically wrote, it's, no one is helping Rohingya because it's not in their interest. So, but I think as human beings, yeah, we are all human beings first, and Americans and Australians and Burmese and researchers and doctors second. As human beings, this is an affront to our humanity. If I consider this an affront to me as a Burmese and a Buddhist, this is an affront to all of you and your humanity. I will stop here. Thank you.